Good morning, everyone. So nice to see you guys out here on this rainy, rainy morning, but uh, um, just uh, awesome to be in the house of the Lord this morning with you. So welcome to the Community Chapel of Heston. Um, just wanted to give you a few announcements. Uh, we are working a, a little bit on a, a skeleton crew today, just some some wonderful COVID exposures. You got to love it. Not really, but God's got a plan. He is sovereign, and, uh, and we, um, we are just rolling with the punches. So um, uh, just blessed to be here with you guys this morning. And so just some of the announcements we want to cover, um, just some youth things coming up um, next um, on the October 16th will actually be our amazing race. So um, young people, if you haven't signed up for that yet, um, that is definitely a fun, fun, fun thing to do. And even some of our older people, if you want to help out with it, um, it can be a load of fun. So there is a sign-up sheet out in the lobby. And so if you're feeling motivated to have some fun on a Saturday morning, put your name on the paper, okay? Um, Because we'd love for you to join us for that. We also have a cool event coming up actually in November, November 20th. So just mark your calendars down for that. That is a teen and parent retreat out at Camp K. And um, we'll have loads of fun with that too. And just um, really um, have a lot of fun with our teens um, and uh, growing our relationships, not only with each other, but growing our relationships with Christ. So again, mark your calendar for that. So those are some youth things. Women's ministry, the secret sister reveal is coming up November 6th. So mark your calendar for that as well. And then also we have a fundraiser coming up here at the end of um, October, the October 30th. That will be a pancake and sausage breakfast, um, which will be from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. We usually have a lot of fun with that. Um, we are raising money to do a uh, team effort trip this week. I mean, sorry, this summer coming up. Um, and uh, um, uh, that is a great opportunity for our kids to be the hands and feet of Christ uh, for, for some people who need it. So again, mark your calendars for that. I believe that is all the um, announcements I have this morning. So if we could go to prayer. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to gather in your house of worship this morning. And and God, we are just blessed to be under this roof this morning. Um, Certainly, uh, the rain can can seem a bit dreary. um, But God, we know that you are using that rain to uh, replenish uh, the soil um, so that things grow. And God, we can use that same analogy in our life whenever we have troubles that come, the rain that falls in our lives, and we're just like, God, why? Um, God, you have a plan. You are sovereign, and you are moistening the soil of our lives so that we can grow in our relationship with you. And we are, we are so uh, thankful uh, for that opportunity to, to grow. We just want to praise you this morning. We want to give you all the glory that you are due. And so we just ask that you receive that from us. God, we just want to thank you. We just want to thank you so much, especially for our salvation, for that cross where uh, you sacrificed your life for us um, so that uh, we don't have to pay the penalty of our sin. You have paid that for us. But God, not only did you die for our sins, you were resurrected. And God, that gives us hope, a hope for an everlasting life with you um, in, in heaven, uh, being in your presence. And, and God, that is just an awesome, awesome thing to wrap our mind around. God, we want to ask for comfort. Uh, for those who are uh, grieving and for those who have been dealing with uh, illnesses in their life. We just ask that you wrap your comforting arms around them and see them through this this time of trial. And again, God, just use that uh, for your glory. Draw others closer to you through those through those trials, whether it be uh, the person who is afflicted or whether it be the people around um, that they will grow um, in their relationship with you. I want to ask a special blessing for Nelson this morning as he brings the message for us. And, and just, God, we just ask, him, ask you to use him as a vessel, a vessel that uh, speaks your words into our hearts um, this morning, words that um, will uh, educate us, that will, that will draw us closer to you and, and ultimately better, make us better disciples for you that we can reach out to that world around us. Um, And again, we just ask for a blessing over all aspects of the service today. Again, that number one, it brings you the glory that you deserve and draws others closer to you. We love you and praise you. Amen. 
All right, well, I hope you guys brought your singing voices today. Um, so we are going to uh, dive into the, um, into the, the chorus books here directly after um, I read some scripture for you. But uh, we'll be out of the chorus book, course 83, but it will be on the screen as well. But first of all, let's take a look at our passage this morning, which is in Romans 8. Um, verses 31 through 39. And if we could stand up for the reading of God's word. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the only one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us, who will separate us from the love of Christ. Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword just as it is written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Nothing can separate us. Do you take comfort in that today? Nothing can separate us from the love of God. So think about that as we head into Chorus 83. Oh, how he loves you and me. you and me oh how he loves you and me he gave his life what more could he give oh how he loves you oh how guys he does love us and it's one of those things that we shouldn't be keeping to ourselves you know we need to share that with others his love should stir in us a desire to reach out to those around and share share that story share his love share what he's done with us so that they can find that relationship with Christ as well so let's sing about that um, through hymn 516, which is, I Love to Tell the Story. Because 
found also in Romans, Romans 10, looking at verses 12 through 15. Let's join together in reading God's word. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. Guys, are we bringing the good news? Again, Going back to what I said before, are we sharing with our friends? Is God going to find us faithful in sharing his word with a hurting world? Let's join our voices together and sing, Find Us Faithful, Chorus 227, or the words should be on the screen. be 
seated. And children, you may be um, dismissed to Children's Church. Nelson? Well, good morning. I'd like to welcome all of you to our service this morning and also welcome those that will be watching online a little bit later. Uh, our service is somewhat different this morning. You have a different set of characters as we have a number of our main uh, characters that had planned to do this service today missing. I got word yesterday after lunch that our pastors would not be able to be with us. And so uh, I will be filling in this morning and Seth Hoffman will be filling in this evening. So I invite all of you to come back and listen to Seth's message this evening. And I'd like to say briefly that there may be a few of you here this morning that might have heard part of this message from an evening study I had given earlier in the year. And if so, it's just a chance for you to reinforce those scriptures. The title of my message this morning is called, What's Next? What's next is a question. It's a question that requires an answer. It's a question that may require us to make decisions. It's a question that may require us to consider certain actions in our life. And we're going to look at two stories, one from the New Testament, one from the Old Testament, one involving a single man, one involving four men, one involving a man who had accumulated a lot of wealth. The other four men, destitute and poor. One man who, as far as we know, was very healthy. The other four men who were suffering from the scourge of leprosy. But what we're going to do is try to take a look at probably the most important day in the lives of these two different groups and see how they came upon a certain situation and how they reacted to that situation. And I think in it we can find some lessons that we can take and apply to our life. So we'll begin with the account of the most important day in the life of Matthew. An account written by Matthew from the book of Matthew in chapter 9. And this is the most important day when Matthew, formerly known as Levi, got to meet Jesus. And what's interesting in Matthew's account of himself, he's very modest, he's very humble. He literally tells us nothing about himself except one thing, in contrast to Luke, who gives much more details of this story. Matthew only says one thing. He says, I was a tax collector sitting in a booth. And in doing so, Matthew portrays himself as literally the worst of the worst. Because the tax collectors, the publicans, were very despised by everyone. They were despised by the Pharisees. They were despised by the common people. The Pharisees despised them because if you wanted to get into the position of tax collector, you had to buy it from the Romans. And most of those people had to sell their land or maybe even their home or their possessions in order to buy that position. And the Pharisees frowned on that because they felt people were selling a part of the promised land in order to gain financial gains for themselves. The average person, the Gentiles, despised the tax collectors too because the rich people would come to the tax collectors and they would bribe them to lower their taxes, which then raised everyone else's taxes in order to meet the quota assigned to the tax collector by the Romans. And so tax collectors were despised so much, so much so that they were barred from the synagogue. They were forbidden to have contact with Jews. They were considered in the same terms as traitors and liars, and they were even forbidden to give testimony in a Jewish court. That's how despised they were. They were considered the worst of the worst. Well, one day, Jesus is walking with some followers through Capernaum. 
And he comes to a town. And of all the people that are standing there that he could have talked to, he walks over to one person, a tax collector, sitting in a booth. The man by the name of Levi, who we eventually get to know as Matthew. And he talks to Levi, and he invites him to follow him. And Levi gets up and invites Jesus to his home. And Levi sends out the word and invites other tax collectors and other sinners to come to his house. And they sit down, and they eat, and they talk with Jesus. Now for the Pharisees, this was a no-no. Because the Pharisees and their self-righteousness, they could never conceive that a good Jew would ever go to a house and sit down and eat with sinners or tax collectors. It might be all right for a sinner to go to a Jewish religious leader and talk, but never, never would a good Jewish leader go to the house and sit down and actually eat with people of this type. And so the Pharisees, they rebuked the disciples. They asked a question, but it wasn't really a question, it was a rebuke. They said, how can your teacher go and eat with these tax collectors and sinners? We'll pick up the story with Matthew's account. And when Jesus heard this, he said, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. You know, the one thing I love about Jesus and his ministry is how he put his message in such simple, easy-to-understand terms. He used simple analogies. He used parables. And he says simply here, look, everybody can understand this. It's not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. And then Jesus goes on, and he says, go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. And in those two verses, I think we really get the whole essence of the gospel, that Christ, that Jesus, came to earth with one purpose in mind, to come and reach out to the unsaved, to share with them his Father's words, to share with them the plan of salvation, and ultimately to take on the sins of the world when he was on the cross and die with all of our sins on his shoulders, but with the words of Father, forgive them, on his lips. That's the whole essence of our gospel. That describes the plan of salvation that allows us to have the promise of spending eternity with God. We learn a lot from that short few verses that Matthew tells about the day he met Jesus. We learn that Jesus came to save sinners. We learn that Jesus was willing to go and witness to them in their environment. Now, it's important to understand when Jesus went there, he didn't go there and assume their bad behavior and engage in what they were doing. He went there with a purpose. He went there to share the good news. Jesus was one who wanted to develop relationships. Jesus was one who was not afraid to jump across societal barriers and reach out to a Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus was willing to go to witness to the unsaved. We see that Jesus offers grace and forgiveness to the most despicable and most undesirable people who repent, even those nasty tax collectors. Jesus then enlists these, quote, despicable people, Jew and Gentile, for his purpose and for his mission. So, after this meal, after this meeting with Jesus, what's next? What's next for Matthew? Matthew had some choices. Matthew could have said, you know, I have learned something important. And I'm going to try to be an honest tax collector. But really, 
all my income comes from this, so I really need to stay here and continue on. But Matthew didn't do that because Matthew realized he had been given a great gift and he felt a desire and a responsibility to share that with others. And if we look at the life of Matthew in the Gospels, we see exactly what he did. Matthew committed to sharing the good news. He shared his experiences both in word and in writing. Matthew had a strong desire to demonstrate to the Jews that Jesus was really the true Messiah they were looking for. And so he used over 130 quotes and illustrations from the Old Testament to show the Jews that Jesus was fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy. And then Matthew did something very, very unusual. In fact, he began the very beginning of his book of Matthew by writing a genealogy of Jesus. And Matthew did something quite unusual because in those days, genealogies were normally prepared for kings and emperors and high political leaders. And in most cases, they tried to enhance the reputation of that person. So if you had relatives who had won a battle or had done very important things that the public liked, they would insert little notes into that genealogy. If you had someone in your background that did something bad, perhaps the black sheep of the family, they just drop that name off. No need to mention that. And genealogies were normally, if you recall, father begets son, father begets son, father begets son. But Matthew, in starting his book of Matthew, starts out with the genealogy that he traced from Mary to Joseph and then back the male line to Abraham. And he did something really unusual. He put the names of four women into that genealogy, including several women that came from pagan nations. You may remember Rahab, a prostitute who actually gave cover to the spies that came to look at the promised land. He put names in there of people who sinned very harshly against God. And then he also put some information in there that most people would have left out. For example, David was the father of Solomon by Bathsheba, who had been the wife of Uriah. By putting that last sentence there, Bathsheba, who had been the wife of Uriah, it brings back to memories right away that David had had an affair with Bathsheba. And when she became pregnant, he had ordered her husband Uriah to be killed by sending him to the front of a battle and then withdrawing support for him. And many people would have looked at this and said, Matthew, what are you doing? You're inserting all the dirty laundry into Jesus' genealogy. But Matthew had a reason. Because Matthew understood that he had been a sinner, that he was the worst of the worst. And he wanted to show that even the God of the Old Testament was a forgiving God, a God who extended grace to many people who had sinned, done wrong things, but came back into God. And when they did, God could use them for his ministry. Matthew wanted the Jews to understand this, that God was a person who came to save and love everybody, Jews and Gentiles, including those who had sinned. And thus, he wrote the genealogy which showed that Jesus came through lineage that included both Jews and Gentiles, both good people and people who had sinned. Matthew was given a great gift. He thought he had a great responsibility to share it with others. And like Matthew, friends, we too have been given a great gift. A tremendous gift from God. One that we have not earned, but one that's only given to us through his grace. And with that gift comes responsibility. What do we do with that gift? What's next for us 
after we receive that gift. I'll leave you think about that, and we'll switch over to the second story. And we're going back to the Old Testament, to 2 Kings chapter 7, verses 3 to 16. To give you some context on this story, this story occurs in Samaria. Uh, you remember that the Samaria is the northern part of the, in the northern part of the kingdom of Israel. It occurs during the time of the prophet Elisha. And during this time, the king of Aram decided to declare war on Samaria. And he assembled a vast number of troops and horses and decided to surround Samaria. Now, the king had a strategy because Israel was going through seven years of devastating drought. And so this king said, you know what? Here's what I'm going to do. Instead of attacking the city and trying to penetrate the walls, I'm simply going to encircle it. I'll stop anybody from going in or out. We'll lay siege to the city because food supplies are very, very low. We will simply starve these people out and get control of the city that way. Well, that strategy worked. Things became desperate for the people inside the city walls. So desperate that the scriptures tell us they begin to eat things that you and I normally never would even think of. A donkey head was sold for 80 shekels, which is almost eight months' work. A cup of dove dung, not the dove, the dung, sold for five shekels, which was almost two weeks' wages. And finally, as things became desperate, the people in the city resorted to cannibalism. And when the king found out about this, he tore his clothes and he put on sackcloth. But instead of seeking guidance, he blamed Elisha. And he called his captain and he said, I want you to go find Elisha. And I want you to bring him because the king wanted Elisha's head. But Elisha got warning of this. And when the captain came, the people that surrounded him locked the doors and would not let him in. But Elisha did get to talk to the captain. And Elisha said something really unusual. He said, the next day, 12 quarts of barley will sell for only one shekel. You'll have all the food you want. And the king's captain looked up and he said, if God could open all the heavens... Could he even do this? I don't think so. Elisha told him, he said, you will see, but you will never get to eat of the food that's coming tomorrow. Well, the captain left and went back to the uh, city, and back to the kings. And now we're going to pick up the story of the four men, four lepers who were living outside the entrance to the gate. Now, there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate, and they said one to another, why do we sit here until we die? If we say we enter the city and the famine's in the city, we will die there. And if we continue to sit here, we will die also. We're starving. We're near death. Now come, let us go over to the camp of the Arameans, the enemy. If they spare us, we will live. But if they kill us, we will die also. You see, the lepers had three options, and none of them were very good, were they? If they stayed where they were, they were going to die. They were going to starve. If they went into the city, the city would probably reject them, because if you remember, lepers were greatly despised during that time. They were not allowed to mingle with the general population. In most cities, the lepers were forced to be outside the city gate where they sat and they literally begged for food. If they tried to go in the city, they would probably be rejected and even if they went in there, the city was dying too. So let's go over to the enemy. They might kill us, but the end result is going to be the same. So they arose at twilight to go to the camp of the Arameans but when they came to the outskirts of the camp of the Arameans, behold, no one was there. 
For the Lord had caused the army of the Arameans to hear a sound of chariots and a sound of horses, even the sound of a great army. So that they said one to another, Behold, the king of Israel has hired against us the king of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Therefore they rose and they fled in the twilight, and they left their tents and their horses and their donkeys, even their camp just as it was. They fled for their lives. These guys left everything. They had left their food. They left their money. They left their clothes. They even left their horses and donkeys, which I would assume they'd have been on riding out. But they left terrified and in a panic because of the sound that the Lord had created. And when the lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they entered one tent, and they ate and they drank. And boy, can you imagine how they probably ate. Imagine you were starved. Maybe most of your life you're scrambling to get food because you were a leper. But now in the midst of the starvation, you had had little to eat. You're near death. And hey, look at this food. Over here is food. There is food. A whole, enough feed, food to feed a whole army. I imagine they ate until they were full and then ate more until, as we would say, they were stuffed to the gills. Food that they hadn't had for a long time. And then they looked around, and what did they find? Hey, guys, look, here's a bag of silver. Here's a bag of gold. And look at all these clothes. This is life-changing for us. We've never had these things. We're going to have all the money we need. We're going to have good clothes we need. We're going to have all the food we need. What must we do? We've got to take it. We've got to hide it. We've got to preserve it for ourselves. And so they carried from there the silver and gold and clothes, and they went and they hid them. And then they returned and entered another tent. Here's more gold. Here's more silver. They loaded up their arms and they went out again and hid the food and gold and silver, preserving it. And I can imagine they may have been high-fiving. You know, we may not even have enough money to buy a house now. We're not going to have to worry about being beggars. We've got all the money we want to. Now, as you're reading this, I don't know what you're thinking, but I'm thinking, what's wrong with this picture? These guys are stuffing themselves with food. They're planning everything for the future. And what they've totally forgotten about is that whole city back there where people are dying because they don't have any food. Totally forgotten about that. You know, I don't know why lepers didn't immediately say, hey, here's food. Let's go tell the people in the city so they can come out and get food immediately. The scriptures don't tell us this, but I imagine we could probably, all of us could probably speculate. You know, perhaps they were just so emerged in that wonderful gift they got, that life-changing gift that they got. They were thinking of only how it could benefit themselves, how they could have food, how they could have money, how their whole life would be changed. Or maybe one of the lepers said, you know what? The people in the city, they treat us badly. They force us to live outside the gate. They don't care about us, so, you know, they're getting what they deserve. Or maybe one of them said, you know, guys, now's just not the time. The timing's not right. We need to feed ourselves. We need to grow strong. We need to make sure we get as much of this put away because when everybody else is going to come out, they're going to grab it all. So the timing's not right yet. Perhaps one said, you know what, guys? God gave this food, this blessings to us. He gave it to us, for us. If God wanted to, he could have dropped that food over in the city. But he did. He gave it to us. This is meant for us to keep. Or perhaps he may have said, you know what? If we go back to the city, we're going to be rejected. They don't believe us anyway. They just consider we're a bunch of poor lepers. Our words won't carry any weight. But then something happened. 
Then they said one to another, we are not doing right. We are not doing right. This is a day of good news, but we are keeping silent. This is a day of great news, but we are keeping silent. This is a day of life-changing news for us, and it can be for other people. And we are not doing right because we are keeping silent. If we wait until morning light, punishment will overtake us. Now therefore come and let us go and tell the king's household. So what's next for the lepers? Well, the lepers realized they had been given a great gift. And it took them a little time. But eventually they decided, and they felt a desire and a responsibility to share that gift with others. And so they came and called to the gatekeepers of the city and they told them, we came to the camp of the Arameans and behold, no one was there. There was no one there, nor the voice of man, only horses tied and the donkeys tied and the tents just as they were. And the gatekeeper called and told it within the king's household. But the king was skeptical. Then the king arose in the night and said to his servants, I tell you now what the Arameans have done to us. They know we're hungry. Therefore they have gone from the camp to hide themselves in the field, saying, when they come out of the city, we will capture them alive and get into the city. The king thought this was all a trap. But fortunately, one of his servants said, let some men take five horses which are left in the city, seeing that those who are left here will fare like the multitude of Israel who have already perished. Let us send and see. And so they took, therefore, two chariots with horses, and the king sent after the army of the Arameans, saying, go and see. And they went after them to the Jordan. And behold, all the way was full of the clothes and the equipment where the Arameans had thrown away in their haste. Then the messengers returned and told the king. So the people went out and plundered the camp of the Arameans. Then a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel according to the word of God as prophesied by Elijah. And you know what happened to the king's captain? When the people rushed out of the city, he fell and was trampled to death, fulfilling the prophecy of Elisha. You will see, but never get to eat the food which is coming. You know, the lepers, it took them time, but they recognized they had been giving a great gift and a gift that could benefit others. And so they made a decision to share that with others. And again, I ask us, what wonderful gift have we received from our Lord and Savior? And are we willing to share that gift so that others can also be saved? In reading of the scriptures, which Jamie did, there's a couple key verses there. And they're verses written by Paul in Romans 10, 13 and 14. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That is the good news. That is the life-changing news. That is the news that can change our eternity. What wonderful news. It doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done. It doesn't matter all the turmoil you've been through in your life. If you're willing to call on God, ask for forgiveness, honestly repent, turn to a new leaf in your life and put your trust in God, God gives us the promise of forgiveness, of removing our sins as far east as from the west. And the promise that we can spend our eternity in glory with him.
But then Paul goes on and adds these words. How then they call on him, that's God. How can they call on God? They have not believed him. And how can they believe without hearing? And how can they hear without a preacher? Paul's making very, very clear. You have to believe in God in order to ask for forgiveness and accept his plan of salvation. How do you believe in God if you haven't heard? I'm going to take the liberty and change that last line up there. How can they hear without a preacher? And I'm changing it to, how can they hear without you and me? You know, friends, I can go up to the mountain, and I can sit there, and I can see the beautiful trees, I can see the wildlife, the plants, autumn's glory, I can look at the galaxy and see the stars at night, I can see the beauty of the ocean, and I can be moved and say, you know what, this didn't just happen by chance, somebody created this. But I can sit in that mountain day after day, and that mountain will never tell me what I need to do to be saved. I can listen to music, and I find music stirring. I love to listen to music. It makes me think, restores me. I can listen to beautiful lyrics and beautiful melody. But just listening to a beautiful melody doesn't tell me God's salvation. I can visit the fish hatchery up at Seven Points, and I can see one tiny little cell taken from a male striped bass, and one tiny little egg taken from a female striped bass come together, and in 50 hours' time, that egg hatches, and out comes a baby fish. And in that 50 hours, those two tiny microscopic cells come together, and they develop a skeletal system, a circulatory system, a nervous system, scales, eyes, fins. And I'm sitting there saying, how can these two tiny cells do all of this in 50 hours' time? There must be somebody else who designed this. But I can watch fish for days after day, and those fish won't. Tell me God's plan of salvation for me. I can even look at Christians that I admire. I can say, look at Joe. He's got something special. Joe's kind. He's considerate. He's always willing to help. I never hear him swear. Joe seems like he has something that's real to his life. And I can admire that. But just simply looking at Joe doesn't tell me about God's indescribable love that he was willing to send his son to die on the cross so that I might be saved. Now, perhaps Joe can. You see, sometimes we simply say, telling others about the gospel, that's a story of our preachers and missionaries. And you're right, it is. But God needs us to be part of that process. Our salvation is based on Christ's death on the cross and resurrection. That's a historical event that we either need to be told about or read about to know of its existence. We simply won't learn of that, simply looking at the mountain or fish or the good behavior in other people. Pastor Stanley said a quote that I like, with the receipt of a great gift or a great discovery, there comes a responsibility. What are we going to do with that great gift? The reason I changed that last line to include you and me, take a look at these statistics. 29% of Americans never attend church. As a matter of fact, that percentage is going up. But they are in our workplaces. They are at school. They are in our fishing clubs. They are in our sports groups. 
They're never going to come and hear Pastor Scott or Pastor Doug. They'll never be in a church Bible study. But they are people that we meet with and that we talk with every day. The only way they will get to hear the good news if someone is willing to tell them. The people who identify themselves as Christians has dropped from 51% to less than 40% since 2009. So the pool of Christians or people proclaiming they believe in Christ is steadily going down. And in this country, in the United States, if we take every religion, everyone, and look at the number of leaders, each leader has over 6,000 people to take care of. And that includes all the religions that would be in direct conflict with what we believe. If you look at those religions that would be compatible with our beliefs, Pastor Scott and Pastor Doug probably have between 10 and 15,000 people. That's why we meet. The average church in America gets one unsaved person coming into fellowship a year for every 85 members. That's the average church. Some churches get 25 and 35. Other churches got a big zero. That's why you and I need to share the word. And even more saddening and disappointing are recent Barna statistics that show about 23% of Christians now feel it's inappropriate to evangelize. How sad and how disappointing that people who are saved by very grace of God and have their eternity changed forever through God's forgiveness and grace, feel that it's inappropriate to be concerned about where somebody else, their neighbor, their person in the workplace will spend eternity. Then look at these next statistics that I highlighted. If you ask people who are on church, if you ask people who are unsaved, who come to church, come into fellowship, what was it that brought them? 53% of the unchurched who joined a church did so because one person from that church shared direct personal evangelism. And another 12% was somebody else, maybe it's a family member, maybe it was a neighbor, shared with them the good news of the gospel. So two-thirds, 65% of those people who do come, who were on church, do so because one person took the time and was convicted to share the message of God with them. That's so important for us to know. You know, it's easy having received God's gift of salvation that I can be entirely focused on me. I can be focused on how great God is and I want to praise him and, and, and love him and that's good. I can be so excited about the changes he's making in my life, how he's helping me control my anger, how he's helping me overcome my temptations, how he's helping me be a better person. But if my whole relationship with God is all about me, then I would suggest we need to reflect on the leper's statement. We are not doing right. This is a day of good news, but we are keeping silent. It's so important that we're willing to share. And if I'm standing here in the pulpit telling you should share, then I also need to share. And so I want to say very candidly, you know, if there's someone here today or someone that watches this video later, and you haven't come into a relationship with Christ, I urge you to do that. You know, God offers forgiveness to everyone. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done. If we come to God and ask for forgiveness and repent and honestly turn away from our old life and place our trust in God, God will wipe our sins away as far as from the east, as far as the west, and he'll grant us the promise of eternal life with him. And if you don't have that promise in your life today, I would urge you to, to come and seek that promise. Come to God in prayer. If you want to talk with the elders or our pastors here, we would love to talk to you. Your eternity is at stake. 
and I would urge you to come and find the gracious, redeeming love of Jesus Christ. So what's next? This time, what's next for you and me? What do we do? We've been given the greatest gift a person could ever receive. And it's a gift that we don't deserve. It's a gift that we never earned. It's a gift based on the soul, love of God, the grace of God, the forgiveness of God. A God who, at the time of creation, as I mentioned a couple Sundays ago, he's holy and he knew what man was going to be like. He knew if he created man, there were going to be all problems. He knew if he gave man control of his life, allowed him to make decisions, there would be problems. And yet that holy God who could not tolerate evil had such great love, he created man and he provided a pathway so that we could come into relationship with him and have eternal life with him in glory. What a wonderful gift. My hope is that if we leave today, we give some time and think about this, that we can recommit to say, Lord, today is a day of good news. I want to go back. I want to go back to that city of all those people that don't know you so that others, too, may drink your living water and share the bread of life. Let's pray. Father, once again, your word challenges me. We've received your life-changing, soul-saving, wonderful gift of salvation through the sacrifice of your son on the cross. What wonderful news, what life-changing, what soul-changing news, news that changes where we spend eternity. I pray, Father, that we would not be silent. Touch us, prick our hearts, stir our minds so we never forget there is a whole world in need of your living water and bread of life. May we be the tongue that shares the good news to others, that they may come into fellowship with you, that you may be glorified. Thank you, Father. All praise be to you. Amen. All right, so in thinking about that message here uh, this morning, we are going to go to hymn 507 uh, for our closing hymn, which is Pass It On. And it, uh, the, the first verse says, it only takes a spark to get a fire going. And uh, guys, that spark is going to start with you. So let's pass it on. How about we stand up and sing this out?
greatest happiness that I've found. You can depend on Him. It matters not where you're bound. How shout Him from the mountaintop. How I want my world to come to me I want to pass it it on beautiful singing guys our closing scripture is found in Matthew 28 verses 19 through 20 go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And I, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are with us till the end of the age. God, we just find so much reassurance in that. We should find strength in that. We should find courage. We should find boldness, not in ourselves, but God, from you within us. And God, we thank you for that strength. We thank you for that courage. God, just let us use that for your glory to spread your word to this hurting world around us. Just be with us and keep us safe as we go. We love you and praise you. Amen. Feel free to stick around for Sunday school.